are my Carly's these bikes. <laughs> they the are. Harley Davidson's of bikes. See the battery flash, and it means the battery's dying. Ah. Over to the threshold. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, Just don't go any further than the prom night, okay? <laughs> you know I mean? It's an older woman here, you know? On October 10th, 1988, I was waiting for my sister uh, Ruthie, who was coming down from upstate New York, and we were going to proceed to go to uh, Connecticut to visit my sister Mary. It was my godson's birthday, Stephen. So we're driving up there, Ruthie and I, to go to visit Mary. And about three quarters of the way up, my daughter Karen calls me and she tells me that my son Charlie was in a car accident. And uh, that he was paralyzed. She knew that right away, but the policeman told her that. October 10th, I was working as a busboy at What's Your Beef Restaurant, and it turned out that I was double booked. So the night of my accident, I was actually working. Guy came in, and I said, Saturday night, 18 years old, I'm leaving. I wound up going home, meeting up with a couple friends, and from there, things started to go downhill. I got into a car with a guy who I barely knew. And within a very short amount of time, he was rocketing down the highway at over 100 miles an hour. Not long into our drive, the inevitable happened. A New Jersey State Trooper caught us on radar, put on his lights as we were going into a toll, and the minute we went through the toll, the driver, bam, hit the gas, started rocketing down the highway again at over 100 miles an hour. Seconds later, we tried to exit the highway, the car, jumped the curb, and because I wasn't wearing my seatbelt and we broke in that night, I was ejected from the car over 100 feet. My head slammed into a curb instantly breaking my neck and receiving a permanent spinal cord injury. Which means I broke my neck at the bone C5, C6, which is pretty close to the bottom of your neck. The lowest bone in your neck is the C7. And that meant that along with being paralyzed and having all kinds of restrictions on what I could move and what I could feel, that I was going to have to spend almost a year in rehab. A year that was supposed to be my freshman year of college, meeting people, building relationships, working, going to college. Instead, I was flat on my back in a rehab hospital, pretty much learning to do everything that my life experience from being a baby to being an 18 year old, I had to get up enough strength so I spent an entire year in the hospital going through rehab with this big, first three months I had a big clunky thing called a halo on my head and a broken wrist. So it was a very long process that was very difficult and challenging and sometimes very upsetting for me and everyone who was involved. I went to rehab first in McGee Hospital in Philadelphia. And then I got an amazing break. My insurance agreed to send me to Craig Hospital near Denver, Colorado. And Craig, you know, they had pretty good rehab. It was pretty standard. But what they had that nobody else had at the time was an amazing recreational therapy program. I went down to the recreational therapy department 
and I looked at the list of things that they offer. Camping in the Rockies, water skiing as a quadriplegic, white water rafting, hot air ballooning, multiple different concerts. I'm like, wait a minute, I thought I was a quadriplegic. I thought I was paralyzed. I never for a minute thought that I would still be able to do all these amazing things that many of them I had wanted to do, but thought when I broke my neck, I lost the opportunity. So that part of rehab was an amazing self-confidence booster. I was able to do things that I never expected to do. So by the time I was 19, I had done so many more things because of the recreational therapy department than I would have ever been able to do if it hadn't been for my injury, ironically. At 18 years old, I had a lot of friends. I just graduated from high school. I just started college. So I had a very strong support system. Immediately after my accident, my hospital room, luckily for me, was filled with friends and family every single day. I was in Philadelphia. It was almost two hours from where I actually lived. My mom, who was without a doubt the most important part of my support system, she is a registered nurse, and at the time, she was working full time. She took a leave of absence from work and was with me Monday through Friday, and then she worked double shifts on the weekends. So pretty much she squeezed almost a 40 hour week into the weekends in order to be with me during the week. And then my brother and my sister and all of my friends and family would spend the entire weekends with me. Again, I'm like two hours away. None of them acted any different. They were just cool. They were hanging out with them. Those were the people who were really important and very supportive of me at the time of my accident. The most difficult part of adjusting to being in a wheelchair, without a doubt, was the loss of independence. At 18 years old, I just started driving, I was going to college, I was working part-time doing two jobs, and to go from that independence, where I was able to drive myself wherever I want, go skiing, go camping, spend time with my friends, to get myself to work in college, to instantly losing all of that independence and more or less going back to the dependence of a baby but the dependence of a baby but still having the experience and the consciousness of an 18 year old so that was the most difficult part because i was completely dependent and reliant on other people to do my basic necessities like washing dressing getting in and out of bed even eating and feeding myself at the very beginning I was dependent on other people. His friend Billy Ryan came over and emptied the catheter in front of me and I was like very surprised that at 18 years old these kids just accepted it and went with it. The people who were affected the most were undoubtedly my sister, my mom, my brother, and my closest friends. I heard stories about the night of my accident that my brother punched in a windshield, my sister was hysterical crying. She was a big help with helping handle talking to the police and helping with the hospital, but she was a wreck. Her initial thought, oh my God, uh, you know, just unbelief, not, not really understanding this whole thing, you know what I mean? Knowing that he was in the passenger seat and it wasn't his fault. I mean, I had all this stuff in my head that... But as you might guess, my mom was the most impacted, but she was impacted offset, so to speak. She never came into the hospital and cried. She never came in the hospital and showed any kind of stress. She always cried outside the room because she knew how important it was for me to have as much normalcy under the circumstances with the severe injuries that I had and not really kind of knowing what was next she knew I didn't need the additional stress of having my mom the person you care about and the person who cares about you the most coming in crying hysterically every time she saw me it was very difficult getting used to being paralyzed and at one point a couple weeks after my injury, I said, God, what can I expect from my spinal cord injury? And he said, 
with the right training and with the right with the right equipment you will be able to drive again you'll be able to go back to college eventually if you want you'll even be able to have kids so that was a big boost for me but I also knew that I wasn't going to be able to ever again be able to feel from where I'm touching here down. I have no movement or feeling. I'm not able to open and close my hands. I can move my wrists up in this direction, but I can't move them in this direction. I can move my biceps, but I can't straighten out my arms and use my triceps. I also have no control over my bowel and my bladder. I have to have a nurse come in to help me move my bowels and I have a catheter. All those things being said, the biggest impact, direct impact, was the fact that I can't walk. I can't get out of bed. I can't stand up. I can't go up and downstairs. So the movement, the lack of movement, and the restrictions on what I can do that I used to be able to do, that is without a doubt the most impactful things that go along with my spinal cord injury after my accident. About 10 years ago, I moved to a new location and I was shopping around for new help. Uh, I need registered nursing care, I need home health aid care, I need care on a daily basis. And I put an ad out into Craigslist and the joke is that I met my best friend on Craigslist. I put an ad on Craigslist for uh, RN and uh, LV showed up. She showed up at my office, my place of employment, and she was really curious. She's like, quadriplegic that drives, a quadriplegic that works, quadriplegic that does all these things that, from her experience, she didn't know a lot of quadriplegics being a nurse, working in the hospital. Most of the people that she met were dependent. So, LV is my best friend. We met on Craigslist, yes we did, and she takes care of me most of the time, every day, both with her heart and with her nursing skills. And we have had a wonderful friendship together, uh, which has allowed us to become family and travel all over the world together. The way I react when people say things to me like, you're an inspiration, it's kind of evolved. My mother used to say to me all the time, she used to say, everything happens for a reason. And I'd roll my eyes and I'd be like, yeah, easy for you to say, you didn't break your neck, stuck in a wheelchair. But over time, I've kind of adapted to that. And it's kind of impacted me because I think that even with all the struggles and the difficulties that go along with my spinal cord injury, I have been able to impact people in a way that I never expected and in that I'm grateful for. So when I'm telling a story or giving a presentation and people tell me that I've made a difference in their life, that I've inspired them to do something, or I've just inspired them to look at things in a different way, I take it a lot differently than I originally did. I am grateful for that because Having an injury like this, it's definitely beneficial if you could look at your injury and say, well, yes, it's a horrible injury and lots of bad things have happened. But I've also been able to impact and help people. And that helps me every day. It helps me get by every day, knowing that my injury is impacting and helping other people. And I've actually come to believe that you can take difficult situations and use them as actual opportunities to help yourself and to help other people. And that's what I try and do with my injury on a regular basis. The possibility of a cure has been floating around for a very long time. I have been injured for over 30 years. The, the standard that the doctors would tell me, the nurses would tell me, and the physical therapists would say, you know, there's a lot of research going on at Within 10 years, there's probably going to be a cure for paralysis. And I've always had that in the back of my head, and I look forward to the day that it happens, but I also say, you know, I still have to live today. Whatever happens, whatever comes in the future, 
great if it does happen. But in the meantime, I have to do what I can every day, and I don't pay a whole lot of attention to the possibility of a cure. Once it happens, if it happens, I will be in line. I want to walk again, but I'm not waiting around saying, oh, I can't do X, Y, Z because I'm waiting for a cure. Originally after my accident, I was just trying to survive. Didn't know what to expect from the accident. Originally, I was completely paralyzed. I couldn't move. I could move, but the muscles that I could move were very weak. So I was going through physical therapy. I was going through just trying to sit up in a wheelchair to get my balance back, to get my strength back. My injury back in the beginning was something that I had to fight through, overcome, try not to get depressed. But over the years, I've actually come to recognize that I have had opportunities that I would never have had if it hadn't been for my injury. First, I started my own business, a nursing agency, which has given me financial independence. A huge impact that my injury has had that was completely unexpected is that because of my injury, I have been invited over and over again to speak to people about positive mental attitude and to speak about injury prevention. And I've actually been able to speak to over 50,000 students in five to 600 presentations. And that has been an unexpected gift, actually, that I've had to use the experience as horrible as my experience was, to take the challenges that were presented from that injury and impact other people in a way that I never would have expected. So my wheelchair has had a effect of kind of weeding out superficial people. When I go out, the people who have the big hearts, the people who are caring, are the people who kind of gravitate to somebody in a wheelchair. So when I, when I go out dancing, or even if I'm out somewhere, people who have more empathy have a tendency to gravitate towards me. So that actually works as a litmus test, which kind of weeds out people who probably might be better off not being friends that they're hanging out with in the first place. So yeah, it does, the wheelchair does have a little, of a, a little bit of an effect of keeping certain people away. Yeah. I also know that it probably keeps shy people away who aren't necessarily familiar with somebody with a wheelchair, but there's nothing I can do about that, and I'm very grateful that being in a wheelchair does have a tendency of attracting people who are more loving and caring into my life, no matter where I am. I've also wrote a book about how to turn your challenges into opportunities. It's The Secret of Opportunities, Four Steps to Turn difficulties into opportunities as odd as it sounds and again I'm not trying to insult anyone by saying an injury is a good thing but my injury has benefited me in ways that I never would have expected I have had the opportunity to speak to thousands of people throughout New Jersey and throughout the country about spinal cord injury and about turning your challenges into opportunities and the gift that I've had of optimism. If that's inspired people, I'm grateful for that. Here are some of the highlights of some of the cool things I've gotten to do as a quadriplegic over the last 30 years. Thank you all for watching. It's going to a very narrow entry. There we go. We are going to a tour. There we go. Boat tour. He said he cannot go in, but of course we make it made it work. Go, Charlie. He did it. Woo!
So you ready to skydive? Ready to skydive? We're out here to show people that it's not afraid to fly itself. We're having a great time. We're gonna get some air. We're gonna fly. It's rare, rare, man. And fly. Very nice. Cool. Cool. I will see you in the plane. That was awesome. Awesome. Oh, Freaking awesome. <laughs>